we are now teetering on the edge of the abyss. It is almost five years since Cyril Ramaphosa became president after Jacob Zuma resigned in February 2018. More than five years since Daily Maverick and our partners Amma Bungani and News24 started publishing the Gupta Leaks. So, a few weeks ago, President Ramaphosa delivered his plan on how to implement the Zondo Commission's recommendations. And to echo our Daily Maverick colleague, Marianne Merton, he is indeed attempting to fix the system itself. Some points are definitely strong and well-intentioned. And yet, Ramaphosa is still not moving on Carter deployment and not moving openly against any of his ANC colleagues, even as it is clear that the distribution of power and money within the ruling party has created a corruption-feeding frenzy and, even more destructively, spread the virus of incompetence that in itself has the greatest potential to bring our country down. But the people of South Africa refuse to give up. We do not pull up our roots and leave and go make a living elsewhere. Here we sit. Here we sit and we say we had enough of the incompetence, the indecency and the selfishness, those qualities that define the leadership of our country today. Today, all of us here gathered to bare-knuckle our way through our problems and to prove that every problem, indeed, has a solution. The mutual understanding between us today was that we all hope to live in a country where hope doesn't die. In this spirit of help and assistance, of gathering 2022, we at Daily Maverick also have a proposal to make regarding the role media plays in this modern state we all would want to build. But before we at Daily Maverick present our simple and short proposal, a few facts. The fourth estate in South Africa, the media, fought valiantly for truth in, in the days when lies were far more profitable. We stayed true to our mission when cynicism was a safer place to be. We didn't flinch when threats were hurled at us and didn't melt when things got hot. We were holding the line we knew could not be abandoned. It is our common future that we defended and keep on defending. An example that still blows my mind is this. Days after becoming president in 2018, Ramaphosa told the gathered media there that he and the other ANC leaders had become aware just how badly the wheels had fallen off only after we broke the Gupta leaks. It was a very clever statement to make inside of a room full of senior journalists and editors, containing just enough flattery to make them forget for that moment just how indefensible the ANC's decade-long appeasement and shielding of Jacob Zuma was. But logically, only two reasons can possibly explain how the eyes of the majority of the ANC and government were closed so wide shut. Blinding incompetence, meaning that they just couldn't see it, even as it was happening right in front of their eyes. Or willful blindness, because they refuse to see it. We at Daily Maverick spend our days wondering which of these it was. Was it willful negligence, as experienced during the weeks and months after we broke the Gupta leaks, when the prosecuting authority led by Sean Abrams refused to even discuss our revelations? Was it a lack of political courage, as evidenced when we exposed the scale and deprivation of the VBS theft by Julius Malema and Floyd Chivambu? Was it politically inconvenient to go after Iqbal's survey, father of South Africa's decouplets, but also the executive chairman of disinformation player number one, independent media, even after the PIC commission fingered Sekunjalu? Amar Bungani and Daily Maverick further exposed near-open corrupt practices by survey beyond any reasonable doubt. And yet, 
He is still allowed to spread his disinformation widely and harass South Africa's true journalists. That is, of course, while we, South Africa's media, are abused, threatened and cursed by the very people that we expose every day. So history offers some insight here. The only truthful thing that Zuma said in the past few months was a desperate exculpatory attempt. He was right there beside me in the nine wasted years, Zuma said of Ramaphosa, and that he was. One example of Ramaphosa in the know, I am told, was back in 2014 when the revenue service was under attack from Zuma's crony Tomiani. He started by firing SARS's top management. Ramaphosa, then deputy president, was briefed by some of the top management where he pleaded for help and support. Ramaphosa remained willfully blind and allowed the capture of SARS to play out without intervention. Muyani went on to decimate the revenue service's investigative capacity based on the excuse of weeding one or other weird rogue unit. Almost nine years after that briefing, SARS is not what it was in 2014. Though, to his credit, the first crucial decision Ramaphosa made as new president of the Republic was to initiate the commission of inquiry into SARS, and on the back of Judge Nugent's recommendation, he did fire Muyani. Yet, most state capture perpetrators and the new generation of corrupt criminals are now louder than ever. Some of the corrupt politicians will actually compete for senior positions at the ANC's December conference. Zweli Mkhize comes to mind. Our colleague Peter Louis Meiber definitively proved the former Minister of Health planned to rob us blind and that the digital vibe scandal was actually Mkhize putting his network in place for future reference. Some perpetrators belong to the opposition parties, while others in the private sector form a toxic, supportive, gun-running, drug-smuggling network, but have been exposed by people like Karen Dolly as corrupt and posing a systemic threat to our constitutional order. In this chaos that is today South Africa, there remained a consistent, strong, point of strength and dedication to the truth, the media. The, the Zondo Commission report, a product of incredible work by dedicated professionals who truly love this country, has proven what we've been publishing for years was true, that the state was indeed captured, precisely by the people the media over the past two decades fingered consistently and with dedication. Every theme investigated by the Zonda Commission had its origin in journalistic work. Just listening to these arguments, I hope you understand why we in the media sometimes get frustrated. Why did we have to lose so much time before even beginning to address the crimes that were long ago proven beyond doubt? Were all the threats, the abuse, and the sleepless nights, and fearing for our and our sources' lives worth it? Kevin Bloom, under severe pressure, reports on our Deputy President David Mabuza's fingerprints on, corrupt and network, on the corrupt network and political murders in Limpopo. Why do we continue to do this thankless, dangerous job if the authorities plan to ignore us, or like my colleague Marianne Tam had to find out when crime intelligence agents quite possibly broke into her house, that they were a part of the actual problem. Worse, will we have to wait another 10 years for the next commission of inquiry to confirm that the corrupt corruption in the post-Zuma era continued barely unabated? How many lives and minds would be lost in the next 10 years? The soul of Babita Diokaran would ask. I remind myself, there is hope. We are the hope. We have to take ownership, Imtia Suleiman reminded us today. But hope is not a strategy. Ownership is. So in the spirit of the gathering, we are Daily Maverick, offer a practical solution to help remedy our problems described here in two short points. 
The first would be that the media reports and investigations must be taken seriously. It's an awkward point to make, you may think, but a point that cannot be overemphasized. I am told that key managers in the Hawks, the police, and the prosecuting authority just don't read the news. And when the public clamor is so loud that our reports cannot be ignored, all sorts of excuses are made up to ignore and dismiss our findings. The Gupta leaks, for example, have been made out as not proper evidence by the Hawks and prosecuting authorities since we started publishing from it. Another example is when I showed that the bank card stuffed with stolen VBS money followed Julius Malema and Floyd Chivambo right around southern Africa. It meant that they themselves spent the VBS money despite their violent protestations. I managed to match their movements on, as published on social media with the bank payment locations because journalists just don't have the subpoena powers that uh, the justice cluster have. The only thing that the Hawks and the prosecuting authority then had to do after my report showed them where to get the evidence was get a court order granted access to Malema and Chivambo's cell phone records to build a court case, um, a court ready case. By gaining access to their conversations and locations at crucial moments, the prosecuting authority would have had incontrovertible proof of how they planned to benefit from the stolen VBS money and how they spent it. I'm told the authorities did not. I'm further told that telecommunications companies only keep this type of information for a certain number of months and that the Malema and Shivamba cell phone data around this crucial time of the VBS bank heist is in all probability now inaccessible, gone. When we publish, we check our facts thoroughly. Ace Magashule has for years now threatened to take uh, Peter Louis Meiberg to court. He never will. He will not survive a discovery process against Peter Louis. John Schlope hasn't even tried to threaten Marianne Tam with legal action. Malema and Shivamba takes everyone else to court but me. <laughs> to their utter frustration. Rebecca Davis' spotlight shone on UCT has resulted in an independent probe by a judge. Feral Hafaji, Estelle Ellis, Felix Dangamandla, Mark Haywood, and our colleagues at Maverick Life has effected real, tangible change with their reporting and photographs, telling the stories of what is happening in people's lives far away from the show-off politicians' grabby reach. This is not to say that we don't make mistakes. Journalists do make mistakes. And it doesn't say that we are not above being questioned and scrutinized. The salient point here, however, is that we are accountable to our country's laws, to our readers, and to the press ombud. As witnessed in countless cases beyond what could be discussed here today, we are overwhelmingly factual in our reporting. If we publish that someone broke the law, it is very, very likely that they actually did break the law. Should this point be successfully implemented then, the next one, also simple, should follow. Law enforcement should immediately consider media reports and investigations as crucial intelligence. Iron is cast while it's hot. Our investigations often contain a wealth of data that could be used immediately, or it offers a very clear picture of where that data could be found. We understand that the prosecuting authority and the Hawks are overwhelmed and have thousands of cases that need to be investigated. And we understand that it will take years and decades to investigate and prosecute them all. Law enforcement also needs to understand that the people of our country need to see justice done. We heard today in some of the panels that we cannot wait for justice in the next year or the next three years, taking a bet on the future, as Dennis Davis said. We want to know it now. We want to be there today. No one likes slow justice. The Marcello Caucus of the world will end up fighting for many years, 
possibly decades, as Jacob Zuma has shown them how to do. So we propose that we all can walk and chew gum at the same time. We propose that within the prosecuting authority and the Hawks, small but dedicated teams of top professionals are created to immediately check the media's investigations and exposés. We heard before lunch today from police ace Jeremy Veary, who identified the police's largest challenge as the lack of intelligence, as well as training of police officials to gather, interpret and handle this intelligence. Journalists are really exceptionally good at this use our reports as the intelligence pointers that is needed. There's no need for these task teams to comprise of hundreds of experts, a few dozen energized officers who love their country and understand the fierce urgency of now would suffice. Someone who can lies with the Financial Intelligence Center to scrape relevant information from the banks, someone to fire off an immediate Section 205 application to gain access to cell phone and email records, someone to immediately start pulling that spider web together. Within a matter of weeks, often 14 days, they will be able to establish whether there are grounds for further investigation and possible prosecution or not. This effort would cut the time needed to bring criminals to book from many years, decades, to a few months. Efficient, quick weighing of evidence and facts available would curb the possibility of the crooks having time to get rid of crucial evidence. Now that would be the type of winning that the majority of our brutalized population would appreciate and which could perform wonders for our sagging morale. We have wasted all these years. There's so much time to make up. But we must start somewhere. It has to start with us. How about here and now?